Hi, I'm Eric Voss. In the newest X-Men movie, Dark Phoenix has an official trailer. So yeah, this movie is still happening, despite the Fox X-Men universe's announced merger with the Disney Marvel universe. But you know what? After seeing this trailer, I think this movie could end up being the perfect swan song. Maybe a different bird. Phoenix song for the X-Men brand before it gets rebooted, probably. So I'm gonna break down this trailer frame by frame for some interesting details and Easter eggs that you might have missed to explain why we should look forward to seeing this movie in February. Spoiler warning in case I accidentally revealed too much. And uh, let's get started. You think you can fix me? Jean, you are not broken. This is the end. You tell. This trailer opens with a young Jean Grey arriving at the estate of Charles Xavier sometime after the 70s events of Days of Future Past. That's right, we're in the X-Men universe now, folks. The timelines here are crazy! And as we'll see in this trailer, this movie seems to be changing Jean's mutant backstory from the comics. So Jean Grey is an Omega-level mutant. We're talking top level here, people. She has advanced telepathy and telekinesis. And in the comics, these powers manifest when a friend of hers gets in a car accident and Jean's mind kind of links with her friends, causing Jean to go into a car as well. And that's where this cosmic phoenix force discovers Jean's consciousness and binds with it. She likes this young Jean's potential, and she stays dormant within her. That's why when you watch X-Men Apocalypse, well, some of you did, a version of the phoenix force merges in that movie. Now this movie, Dark Phoenix, is pulling from the Dark Phoenix saga. It's really one of the best X-Men storylines. In those issues, there's a space mission that goes wrong, and the Dark Phoenix returns to Jean Grey and takes over. And I assume we will see that next level transition in this movie. And yes, you may remember we did see a version of this story storyline in X-Men The Last Stand, but you know that movie sucked. And Days of Future Past reset that timeline because as I said, the cinematic universe timelines are crazy. And by the way, the music we're hearing here is The End by The Doors. It's a cover of it. And notice how the music plays right over the Fox Studios and Marvel logos. And yeah, I do think this is a meta nod here as this will probably be the end for the Fox Marvel brand of the X-Men before Kevin Feige takes over. But I also think this story will be an interesting end in a different way. But you know, we'll get to that later. Let's move on. Mind is a fragile thing. Takes only the slightest tap to tip it in the wrong direction. This is the end. Charles, what did you do? I had to keep her stable. I protected her. In this section, we get this cool blink jump cut. It happens right after Charles's line about a slightest tap, sending the mind in the wrong direction. The editing here reflects this idea. A mere blink seems to splinter Jean's perception from past to present. We also see that Charles has apparently rebuilt Cerebro sometime in the 1990s when this story takes place, after it and the entire mansion was blown up in the events of X-Men Apocalypse. And as Hank McCoy analyzes Jean and probably sees that her mental activity is off the charts, we hear Charles and Raven debate him highly something from Jean. I'll get more into that after the next clip. From the truth? There's another word for that. Okay, here we see what appears to be the new origin for Jean Grey, Jessica Jones-style car accident that kills her parents. It looks like Jean's uncontrollable telekinesis might have caused this fatal collision. You can actually see how she keeps the broken shards of glass from hitting her face. My theory is that this traumatic memory is what Charles kept from Jean. Perhaps he used his telepathy to wipe the memory from Jean's mind, hoping to protect her from her own inner darkness, but also preventing her from understanding herself and learning to control that darkness when it returns. Nice going, Charles. Also, let's talk about the new blue and yellow X-Men suits. This movie is really steering into that classic color scheme with even simpler stitching. Honestly, I kind of like the reimagined versions of those blue and yellow suits at the end of Apocalypse. You know, I get it. It's good that people can actually breathe in these suits. Let's move on. I came looking for answers. You feel like you don't belong here. You don't. They can't begin to comprehend what you are. She's changing. Okay, in this section, we see this island where Magneto has set up some kind of hippie colony. This could be Genosha. It's an all mutant island nation from the Marvel comics that Magneto rules over. I like this detail that all the structures are metallic. You know, you can see shipping crates, the hull of a boat. Remember, in Apocalypse, Magneto nearly destroyed the planet by unearthing all the metal in the soil and also all the pieces of metal in all the cities. And we actually saw these kind of shipping crates and boats lifted from the ocean floor. So it's nice to see he found a way to recycle all that stuff. I guess the UN is like, you know, 
please just live here and leave us alone. And there's a black rainy umbrella. You know, that means a funeral, but more on that in a bit. And next we see Jessica Chastain's character. Now, it's still unknown what character she'll be playing, but there has been some speculation that she could be the character named Lalandra, who's an alien of the Shi'ar race. The Shi'ar are, are, are another alien empire from the Marvel comics, along with races like the Kree and the Skrull that we've started to learn more about from Captain Marvel. The Shi'ar play a big role in the Dark Phoenix storyline, intervening on Phoenix Force Jean Grey's warpath, and at points putting her on trial and depowering her. Now, there has been other speculation that Chastain could be playing a female version of X-Men villains like Mastermind or Mr. Sinister, but director Simon Kinberg has denied those theories and instead embraced the cosmic elements of the backstory. And we should point out the official synopsis of this movie did specifically mention aliens who wish to weaponize the Phoenix Force and rule the galaxy, so I think the Shi'ar would be the best bet. And after returning appearances of Scott Summers and Peter Maximoff, Aurora Monroe, and Hank McCoy, we move on to the next clip. She's changing. And what? You didn't come here looking for answers. You came here looking for permission. Jean. So as Charles and Raven continue to worry about Jean, we now see Jean with Eric Lyncher. And if you look closely at her eyes, you can see that some of that Phoenix fire is starting to burn. It sounds like Jean was tired of Good Daddy hiding her powers from her, so she ran away to Bad Daddy to get permission to use them freely. Hmm, you know, the internet really ruined Daddy for us. And next, we get a look at what I think will be a very key moment in the movie with a very interesting Easter egg. So the X-Men suit up and confront Jean in this neighborhood where everything goes wrong. But the details are in the background here. Behind Scott, you can see a Bishop power truck, which seems like a possible nod to Bishop, the mutant who absorbs energy and releases it from his body. He's kind of a constant conductor for radiation and electricity. So either this truck is just a little nod to Bishop and his powers, or maybe Bishop is in this universe running an electric company, applying his abilities to just an honest day job. But that's not even the really cool Easter egg that I was referring to. Look at the name of the town on the police cars, Red Hook. Now, Red Hook is a small town in New York State, but the reason it's important here is it was mentioned in the show Legion. Legion is a series on FX that you should definitely check out. It follows David Holler, another Omega-level mutant, who is technically part of this X-Men movie universe. There are references in the show to Patrick Stewart, Charles Xavier, and Dark Phoenix director Simon Kimberg is a producer on the show. So Red Hook was mentioned one time in the very first episode of Legion. The old man overseeing Division 3 referred to a past incident where an uncontrollable mutant did major damage. After what happened in Red Hook, I'd say that's an understatement. And after that, Red Hook was really just left as a mysterious backstory that was never revealed. But now, Dark Phoenix appears to be filling in that gap. Division 3's response to David Hotler was a reaction to the Phoenix incident. I just love that they're putting this detail in the movie. Moving on. She's all rage. Pain. That's all coming out of us. Jean lost control, but she's still our friend. This is your fault, Charles. Okay, here we see more of Jean in action, crashing a helicopter, presumably full of soldiers assaulting Magneto's hippie colony. And it looks as though these guys are sweeping an old metro car that Eric's hippies are living in. We also see some shots of that space mission that the X-Men go on that leads to Jean coming back into contact with the Phoenix. The synopsis has described this as a rescue mission, but we don't really know much else yet. In the comics, deadly radiation from a solar flare nearly kills Jean, but really it's this moment that the Phoenix entity attaches to her and takes over her identity. We also see some sad looking members of the X-Men men in funeral attire, getting mad at each other. I have some thoughts on that later. Let's move on. The world is on the brink. I'm sorry. I didn't stop it sooner. You're always sorry, Charles. And there's always a speech. And nobody cares. There's still hope. Okay, here we see the solar flare that I was talking about, as well as Charles appearing to experience it vicariously through Cerebro. Perhaps he's tapping into Jean's mind, retracing her memories to try to determine exactly what happened to her. Charles apologizes and Eric burns him with a good, nobody cares about your stupid speeches. Which is especially sad when you consider Charles' future apology speech in his final moments. I did something. Something unspeakable. Yeah, I guess no one was really listening then either. And look closely at Magneto's helmet in this locker. Underneath is an old newspaper, and if you look real close, you can see a headline mentioning something about news cameras capture White House. I assume that is from the incident in Days of Future Past, remember when Magneto ripped out the White House safe room to try to kill Nixon in front of the news cameras? But of course, it was actually Mystique, and she proved him wrong ultimately, that by showing these news cameras that mutants aren't monsters, she really prevented a terrible, terrible future. And I think there's a reason Magneto keeps this newspaper and a reason for that single tear, but I'll get to that after the next clip. 
Don't do this. The right to fear me. I've seen evil. Okay, here we see Magneto with a new lineup. We see that Beast has joined his team, turning against Charles, and two newcomers. To his immediate right is Selene. In the Marvel comics, Selene is a mutant villain to the X-Men. She's associated with the Hellfire Club. She's a sorceress and kind of a psychic vampire who psionically drains others' life forces. And to her right is Red Lotus, a martial arts master who started as an X-Men foe, but then later joined them, going undercover in the Hellfire Club. His role was actually teased in Deadpool 2, and an Easter egg. At the beginning of the movie, Deadpool looked at a business card with some Chinese characters on it. Those are actually Cantonese for Red Lotus. Now, also in this section, we see this overhead shot of a funeral. So someone definitely dies in this movie. See, the end song did have more than one meaning. Now, I'm gonna go into my theory for who kicks the bucket, but if you don't really wanna know, skip to this time. Okay, if you look closely, you can kind of figure this out through the process of elimination. In these funeral shots, you can see Hank and Charles, also Storm and Nightcrawler. Though, you know, you would think Storm wouldn't need an umbrella. You know, just make an overdramatic speech and clear those rain clouds, Storm. Nature, I command you, bring forth thunder and lightning. So this death is probably what turns Hank against Charles. So I think we can assume that mutant face-off shot to be after the death. And in those shots, we can see Magneto and Scott Summers are also alive. And given that weepy Magneto shot, I think he's being brought back into the fight due to the death of a character who means a lot to him and to Hank. And really, the only one left who went back to X-Men first class with these guys is Mystique. Yeah, I think she did. In fact, that may be what we're looking at in this close-up of Beast embracing Mystique's face. I think Jean Grey loses control of her Phoenix powers and accidentally kills Raven. And that is what tears the X-Men apart. It would make sense for Jennifer Lawrence to want to leave the franchise at this point. She hates sitting in those makeup chairs. And she has been weirdly the face of the past few X-Men movies. I know she's a big star, but it's just kind of weird when there's a ton of other interesting X-Men characters in the franchise besides Mystique. So her character's death would be a fitting conclusion to this line of films. And the way the Logan movie was an emotional send-off to Hugh Jackman and Patrick Stewart's take on the characters. Looking back, the Fox X-Men movies have been pretty good overall, so they deserve some kind of emotional cathartic moment in their final chapter. And before we move on, we get the clearest image yet of Jean overtaken with the Phoenix Force. Perhaps Jean is getting sucked out into space here and the Phoenix kicks in. Going frame by frame through this, some of those fiery beams definitely have a bird shape to them. Though I kind of see birds everywhere. I run into door frames a lot. Moving on to this last clip. And I'm looking at it now. Okay, our last shot is of Jean Grey with the spirit of the phoenix overtaking her, the fire streaking through her cheeks and her eyes, and ooh, just look at that evil stare. Makes you feel like Littlefinger. Ooh. My question for you guys is, considering this will probably be the final Fox X-Men movie before things move over to Marvel, not including the New Mutants, which is kind of its own thing, which of these X-Men characters would you want to see cross over into the MCU as is, without getting recast? And which character should be rebooted? Personally, I've always loved Bassbender as Magneto. Whatever they do, at least keep that guy around. He's awesome. Comment down below with your thoughts and follow me on Twitter and Instagram at EAboss. And if you love the X-Men and live in the LA area, you know you gotta come check out my live parody show called Infinity Fan, where we can laugh about how weird it is when various X-Men universes collide. Trust me, Deadpool takes care of everything. Kind of. Show details and ticket info are in the description below. And subscribe to New Rock Stars for more deep dives into the stuff you love. Thanks for watching, bye.